first of all, I'm Matt from Loki Battlemats. Uh, I'm half of the team at Loki Battlemats. Uh, Tam, who is the other half, she's going to be on the comments section for us. And we're going to be doing a two hour session here on designing and drawing a dungeon uh, using Photoshop. So very quickly, I suppose a little bit about us is we are a company that produce um, as our primary products uh, books of battle mats. Uh, the main books we've got shown in the, uh, the picture here, which is just sat on my Photoshop screen. And this will be in the same sort of style that we use for some of those books. So let's make a start. So I suppose the first thing to say is when drawing a map, um, you want to know why you're drawing it. So we're talking primarily battle maps here. So something that's at a scale you're going to use for tactical combat. Um, so the standard scale we tend to work to is the same as most other people. So five foot square for an inch. Um, so your first thing to think, I suppose, is how you're going to be drawing your map. Obviously, I'm going to be using Photoshop here, and this is going to be made for online purposes. Although I'll tend to work in print quality so that everything can be printed out as well, which is obviously what we do for all of our battle map books. So like every other map drawing, I think, we start with um, pen and paper. So what we've got here, if I switch screens, oh, switch tabs, this is a dungeon that we drew earlier this week. Um, this is available up on drive through RPG at the moment as a pay what you want title. And I've tried to uh, capture every stage of drawing this map to go through and explain how we've done it. And I'm gonna use similar techniques as this one to the one we draw in this session. So this particular map started on paper. Uh, I'll see how this works on the screen, but it's, just that there, which I have helpfully scanned in. To there. So first couple of things to talk about, I suppose, is what you might want to make sure you put on your map. Um, so first, knowing what your encounter is or knowing what your dungeon or adventure is, is gonna be absolutely paramount unless you're drawing something that you want to get reuse out of and you know you're, you're going for more generic um, which we often do in our products because we don't know what people's adventure are likely to be so generic and reusable is a good thing so for this one here i've gone with um, a couple of different textures and layouts just to sort of show some examples so this one ended up calling Scarred Sanctuary, just because it looks a bit like a temple of some form that's got a great big sort of crack through it, uh, rivers are running through that, and, you know, the bridge into there is destroyed, that sort of thing, so it's seen better days. So, you know, perfect for attention. Um, so I've worked with somewhere where there's not just one entry point, so we've kind of set it up so that we've got somewhere where characters could potentially sort of like crawl their way up um, slippery rocks, a waterfall sort of area, crawl into a sort of a side of the dungeon there, or climb up to what looks like a balcony on a slightly higher level and work their way in there, or just make their way across the ruined bridge and in through the front door. Uh, one thing to note on these sort of maps, I tend not to draw the doors on. Um, they tend to even be better done as assets in a virtual tabletop program or as tokens or 3D printouts, physical um, doors, if you're using um, a printout copy. So from the initial sketch drawing here, um, I then went and created um, a new file. Uh, this one looked to be about a 24 by 48. We tend to work in straight feet, um, just because we quite often do printout battle map versions of these. Uh, where we'll do 2-2, two, 2-3, two, 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 So I went for this one as a 2 by 4 And one of the first things I do after creating a file um, is work out a guide layout so you can see where all of the, the squares and the block and the layout is. 
and do that in a second. Oh, and just to say, I'm going to quickly run through how this map was done. And then we're going to make a start on our own from scratch and see how far we get in the time we've got. Hopefully a full dungeon. If not, I'll finish it up slightly after this and we'll pop this up on drive through as well. So, yep, so quickly going through the, um, the layers and we can come back to these while going through the live map. So I tend to put a guide layer out, then do something super simple to block out where the dungeon flooring is going to be, so where all the rooms and the like are. Um, do a simple sketch over the top there. Uh, this is Photoshop. I think that's already been answered as well. Um, I think there's plenty of other um, graphics applications that can do similar. I mean, GIMP for sure is a free version. Uh, for me, it's it's been Photoshop pretty much all the way, so it's it's the one I know. So there, yeah. So that's a quick sketch over the top to try and get it a bit like the uh, the initial design on paper. And then from there, there's blocking in texture layers. Um, this is a bit of a cheat way. I've got a pattern for some of the flagstones, so I can quickly put all the flagstones in and then start putting texture layers up on where the embankments and similar are going to be. Um, a bit of void fill so that you can see where um, the dungeon layout is going to be, some water, uh, more detail on the water and the embankment edges. Uh, that's more detail on that again. Um, putting some white water into those, which then gets a blur on it just to accentuate and make that look a bit more realistic. Uh, as a highlight layer on top, then we start blocking in walls, uh, tidying up all those flagstones and things. At this point, I took the uh, guides away because the flagstones are now set neatly in the right sort of pattern. Uh, so they're going to fit well when we put them into VTT. And then they get textured, um, lighting effects. Uh, yep, yeah, so for quickly creating the grid, uh, we use a guide layout. Uh, what I'll do is um, go to this map. This is going to be the, the live map that we start drawing. So this needs a grid layout. So new get a new guide layout. And it's just as simple as telling it how many inches there are in the columns and how many in rows. So for this one, I've gone for a 36 by 24. And that has filled those in. Let me just put a background on there so you can see those. So that will very neatly get you exact one inch grids all the way across. And the last couple of bits of this is finishing off textures, putting more colors on the flagstones. Uh, adding an outdoor sort of texture to the rock there, uh, added in the bridge and the balcony, uh, put the exterior ruins and a statue in. Those were done from some assets from one of our other products. Uh, this is just sort of moss and finishing off, and that's the final layer on that. So let's get to the uh, the drawing one. So what I'll do is I'll get as a new layer of a white layer. Now, I've prepped um, a number of the layers here um, just to try and speed up this process for the time we've got. Uh, mainly, it's putting um, big blocks of texture in that we might be using. So I'll go to the top layer here, which is going to be our sketch layer. And we're just going to sort of um, work out what we might want this dungeon to look like. So just a quick note on file sizes and things. So this one's going to be a put them in inches, so 36 by 24, and we're going for 300 DPI as the resolution. Uh, textures, they are from a variety of places. So uh, I subscribe to a number of um, stock assets, um, like um, Adobe Stock and a number of other ones. Um, quite a few of them, they are multiple textures that I've combined together uh, retouched and you know got the way that I like them uh, so yeah there's lots of free texture assets out there there's purchasable texture assets 
And one of the best ways of doing it is just with your phone camera, go for a walk somewhere with the right sort of textures. Um, so we've been setting up for um, our wilderness maps, which is the next set of modular books we're going to be doing. And I've been taking a lot of pictures of the floor and wandering around um, woods and fields and things, trying to get some good texture shots. Uh, so let's go up to the sketch layer. So I'm going to use a similar set of um, textures and things to this one. So water, grass, uh, embankments and dungeon tiles. So let's have a look. Trying to fit everything in in time. Let's make about a third of this map be more outdoor space. So let's just uh, work out where that's going to be. Uh, so let's uh, imagine there's probably going to be an embankment there. Now, one thing I do need to do here is turn off snap. So I don't, you notice that most of the lines are conforming to the guide. Uh, you don't necessarily want that. So you can enable or turn off snap to stop your uh, lines drawing to the guidelines. So we're going to do these as an embankment. Have some water in this middle piece here. Have again some cliff edge stuff here. And then go into a block of dungeon in this interior here. Now, because I know it's going to be dungeon, I'm going to do this as just big blocks so that I can um, block these pits out later. So a new layer. And Dungeon, you're going to want a nice big room somewhere for your boss encounter or a fight against multiple mobs. Something where there's a bit of space to move around, get some tactics going. So let's put a decent sized room in to fill a big chunk over there. Let's just grab a colour for him. I think I want that to be um, further across by one because I'm going to put some corridors in just behind it. So try and get a bit of symmetry by having it the um, same height and uh, at the top and the bottom. Make sure there's a couple of little um, dead corners. Um, at the moment, I've not turned Snap to Grid back on, uh, partly because this doesn't need to be too precise at this stage. This is just um, the sketch version for the dungeon floor, which is nice and angular. So instead of just getting a brush and putting some lines in, I'm just going to do it as nice square blocks. Uh, so it's, uh, let's assume there's a ruined room somewhere there. Uh, let's put another room or two down the bottom here and let's have a connecting corridor. And get that room to have a bit of symmetry, so I'm just going to extend that one out a little bit. Let's use the space we've got at the bottom here for a room. And another one about there. So one thing I'm trying to make sure here is that most of the corridors, the doorways, the entrance and things, there's plenty of um, double spaces. Uh, just so you can get large monsters to move around and so that your characters, like your party, can move around each other. Um, so I think there's a question on digital versions. Yep, so all of our digital versions go onto um, drive through RPG. Now that looks like there's space for another room up here, so let's uh, tuck one in. 
Uh, let's have this one have a small corridor. So if there is a large monster in this end room, it's going to have problems moving into here. So players might be able to use that as a bit of a safe space. So just to show that this one up here is going to be um, water. And it's put a bit of blue in there. So that, that's our sketch. Um, we'll have a dungeon on the side of a riverbank, a uh, couple of interconnected rooms inside, a uh, place to have your entry into the dungeon, uh, a nice big room for the main fight or skirmish, and a couple of rooms for it to spill over into or to have other points of interest or whatever else you're uh, planning on doing. Um, now, it's nice to put extra ways to get in, I always find. So let's have another broken corridor. Let's have some over here. OK, right, so we've got our dungeon sketch layout. Uh, and if we go back to our examples here, we're kind of at this stage. Let's take that one off. At uh, this stage here. So the next thing I did then on this one was put some base layers in. So this is just big chunks of texture to fill the various spaces. On here, I have very much prepared these earlier. So I have a big bit of base layer there. This is a texture I tend to use underneath um, dungeon tiles. So it's kind of a couple of different shades of brown uh, that work well as the sort of grouting lines between flagstones. So we're just going to take the freehand selection tool and just chop big chunks of this off because we don't need them underneath these areas. In fact, because I'm going to put grass on this other bank, that's a different texture layer. So I'm just going to get rid of this entirely. And hopefully this time not hitting my keyboard and losing control of the mouse. All right, so then I've got a grass layer here. I only really want the grass in that top corner. So I'll take a chunk of that and then just take it off of the rest of the map. So now we know where our sort of under flagstone texture is, where our grass texture is. Uh, I've got a water texture hiding under the bottom here as well, uh, ready to fill this piece in. So what I'm going to do now is take the topmost sketch layer off. And on the water, one of those layers is a highlight layer. So that one, I've got that as a color dodge layer. And it's normally set to just a slightly darker um, blue than the average of the water. So setting that on color dodge gives me a nice highlight effect over the water texture, which is a bit duller there. Um, but what I can do is Let me take that as a brush. So this is the eraser. It just means I can take the bits of the water that I don't want to be as highlighted and tone them down a bit. I'm going to try and be quite quick on a lot of these just so we can get through a lot of different steps and not necessarily <laughs> check every little last detail on each one. Uh, so that's the water and the water highlights. So the next bit I'd look to do is these embankments. So the first one of these, I'm going to need a brush. And this is a pattern layer. So let me just uh, get the layer effect up. So this one has a pattern overlay, and that's some cracked up dirt um, set for a luminosity, so it'll um, show the color that you're putting down underneath it. So for this, I'm going to move that across the sides of where the uh, 
sort of cliff face of the dungeon is. And I'm going to do it underneath that pattern as well because we're going to um, break those flagstones later to make them look like they're cracked into the water. So I just need to see underneath there. And for the other bank, I don't want that to be quite so rocky. So we're just going to get a browner texture for that and take the brush size down a bit. And then work another edge in there. Uh, what I tend to do as well on those is then take a sampling of the watercolour and then go back in again with a lower opacity brush just to put in what then look a little bit like underwater details. So let me zoom in a little bit there. So that those bits of texture, because they're the same blue, they'll fade in and give you a little bit of a submerged look. So just run that along the edge of each of those. And then we'll do the same on the other side. And because it's nice low opacity, it should blend in with the, uh, the upper colors. So that looks a bit more like a river um, going across there now. Uh, what I've got just to add to that is a white water layer, and this is just white lines, just to kind of show where the flow of water might be or similar. And just sketch them in. Uh, they look a bit too straight and uh, defined. I tend to give them a blur. Uh, which in this case is going to just be a Gaussian blur. Uh, 33 is about right, so we'll go with that. So now there's a couple of like, you know, bits of white water crashing through a bit, give it a little bit more uh, sense of movement and the like. So here I've got a, what I've called a pebbles layer. So this is to try and get some more underwater style details. So again, let's get a nice blue from the water. Take this brush and then just move it through. Oh, yep, so the um, color sampling in Photoshop, um, the way I tend to do it is just double click on your primary color and it will come up with a color picker or you can pick color picker from the tool set. And just select and I, I just tend to go by eye so try and get a color that's about right uh, so this one may not show up too well on the screen there so I'll just uh, take a zoom in again So what this is doing is adding stones and texture at the base of that as well. So you can see a little bit of, um, you know, what could well be um, the riverbed. So again, it's just trying to give a bit of depth to um, the flat sort of water textures. I'll just run that along each side. And I've got another two or three sets of textures which will um, go on the edge of these, but I'm not going to do those just yet. We'll do those later once we've got the um, the flagstone floor going, I think. So for the flagstones, um, what I've got is I've got a predefined pattern um, which will make drawing these nice and quick. So I've selected the areas that we want to be the dungeon floor. Uh, I'm going to hide that layer where we drew those, go to this flagstone pattern layer. And now I just need to pick a color that we're not going to be using anywhere else. So I can easily um, select it out. I'm going to go for this uh, lovely bright green. And because I've got um, a pattern layer on here with um, flagstones I've previously drawn, um, and this is a seamless texture. Um, it means I can then 
Well, let me show you the um, pattern layer quickly first. So it's a custom pattern layer. So I've previously gone and drawn, I think it's a 24 by 24 of flagstones that seamlessly goes off all edges. So if I bring it into here at 100% scale and full normal blend, it just puts it into the design I've got. And I can then rasterize that um, layer effect. Then select the highly bright green. And that'll give me all of my flagstones. Now there's a couple of little spots where the bright green has survived. I just need to get rid of those. Uh, in theory, I could have done a select color range to try and make that a bit quicker and easier. But there's only a few of them around the edges by the look of it. And at this point, I'm going to turn off um, the grid. Uh, just have to quickly double checking that those flagstones are indeed fitting predominantly within the grid. Uh, I don't mind a little bit of um, play around the grid as long as the majority of the flagstones there. If they're a bit too rigid, it doesn't look quite as natural. Right, so that's our flagstone pattern in. Uh, I've got a void fill pattern here, which is effectively going to be all the spaces that are currently brown. So let me just select this range, bring the void fill up, and then take that corner, oops, wrong way around. Take that corner of it off. And that'll give me more of a dark, contrasty sort of a inside of the dungeon sort of a background fill. Uh, so the same one that's been used on this one here. So next, we're probably going to want to look to do our walls. So I have a wall layer set up here. And we're going to do this. Actually, I got rid of those guides too soon. So let me just uh, bring those back. We're going to draw these out quite simply and then neaten them up as one of the, the last steps. So I'm going to take a pencil just so I get the full hardness of that. And I've got to try and make sure each of these sits outside of the usable squares inside the dungeon so that you can make full use of um, all the space inside. And I'll draw a couple of these and then um, show the layer style that's um, been applied to these. And this is a shift uh, drawing. So all I do is I choose um, an endpoint, press shift to the next endpoint and draw it in. And with these, I tend not to use snap because I prefer it when they are slightly uneven. And one of the steps that I tend to do later, which I may not have chance on this one because it's quite time consuming, is put smaller um, brick gaps in. So just go through, cut those wall sections from the pencil lines, and then just take individual sort of brick chunks and just shift them up or down by one or two um, spaces just so it gives you a proper uneven kind of wall finish. All right, so back onto this one. Now that one actually did cut a bit too far in, so I'm just going to take that one out again. Make sure they do sort of stay outside of the uh, the usable squares. Yeah, I've done a few there. Let me tidy those up. All right, so paying more attention while doing it this time. Yeah. And many thanks to Tam for answering the chat section. <laughs> I see some of the messages, but I'm afraid not all of them. So uh, she's got you covered there. And yes, uh, Photoshop is what we're currently using. 
Uh, I suppose the key is anything that will do layers, layer effects, and should work just as well. Obviously, you can also draw your uh, dungeons uh, by hand, especially if that's uh, what you've got at your table. But for this particular demo, we're going to go into how we do it in Photoshop. I'm going to make these walls near the end look a bit more cracked and broken, so I'm not going to take them all the way out. So just a quick look at the effects that are going on on these walls. Uh, there's a few there, but they're fairly simple. So we've got a bevel and emboss just to give them a bit of a stand-up shape so they sort of pop out from the background of the map a bit. Uh, that's got a texture on it just to give them a bump. So without these layer effects on, it would just be a flat gray line. Uh, so we've got a rocky pattern layer over the top as well, just to sort of, again, make them a bit more stone sort of block-like. Uh, an outer glow so that each side has this little uh, gradient sort of like a um, glow off of it and a drop shadow i tend to always do um, light coming from top left so each of these walls has a little implied shadow trailing off in that direction and without those effects on it's just gray lines let's just fill in the last couple of these I suppose another question is, how are people finding the uh, online version of a convention? That's why I definitely needed to not be pressing shift while going to a new um, set of walls. I don't think we need diagonal walls across the hallways just yet. Okay, that's all of the uh, the wall segments blocked in. I'm going to take the uh, the lines off again. And now we're going to start on our um, actual stone pattern uh, for the flagstone. So I've, I've pre-made all my layers for how I tend to um, pattern these up. So easiest thing is going to be to take this layer and just move it down onto that layer. So this first layer is the basic sort of like shape and pattern for the uh, the dungeon floor. So let me zoom in a little bit and just show you what the layers are doing there. So with that layer turned off, eventually, yep, um, it's just flat color. I notice there's still a tinge of that green there, so I'm just going to desaturate that layer just to make sure that's all gone. Let me just select all first once it's finished that. All right, so that'll remove any uh, glimpses of color from the edge of that. Uh, so this layer here has, again, some bevels and some drop shadows on it. So we've done an inner bevel. So these are slightly raised to look at, and they are casting a slight glow and a shadow. This will be seen better, actually, if I um, remove the void fill from underneath the, where the dungeon floor is. So let's do that now. So the easiest way is probably going to be to grab this layer back. Just use it to make the selection. Uh, in theory, I could have done a selection mask for that earlier, but it's just as easy to take uh, that layer and uh, copy it off. 
So now we should have the um, the grey in um, sorry the brownish sort of infill between the um, tiles instead of the uh, the black that we're using for the void fill. Now I'll just use the uh, selection wand and invert my selection. So I've now selected the exact same blocks as the um, the dungeon floor here. And there's a texture layer just here that I'm going to uh, fill in. So that adds another layer over the top of patterns. I'm sure I'll have a quick look at. Uh, so this one, yep, is a pattern overlay. So this one is, I think it's a picture of some pebbles, uh, but it's set on a divide, so it kind of does the inverse of the picture. Uh, but for this one, it's one I've played around with a few times, and I like the um, sort of stippling it gives you on top. And it helps make them, you know, more unique per stone, as it were. Because uh, one thing you want to try and avoid is repeating patterns, whether that's on pattern overlays or, you know, the actual things are cut out for the drawing itself. Now we've got two more effect layers here. So let's keep that selection mask. So this one just adds a couple of um, darker tinges, uh, but I'd only want it to be affecting where the flagstones are. So I'm just going to delete it off of the other areas. And same, this layer lightens everything up to a degree. And I'm just going to take that off of the other layers and leave it on the flagstones. And the last bit I've got on here is um, cracks to add to the uh, individual stones. So for this one, I want to be selected just on where the flagstones are. And something like that nice medium gray will do. And let's just zoom in to show you what this does for them. And I'll be particularly doing this at these edge ones that look a bit broken. But it adds in a crack texture. I'm just trying to read that comment. I tend to leave them all as layers and it does make things chug. Um, I tend to have to make sure I've not got too many maps open at a time and that my computer can handle having lots of layers. Uh, it's better to be able to be able to get back in and readjust things and the like. So I think it all depends what your computer's capable of handling. But yeah, it's it'll be slowing down as we're doing this, especially as I've got some other very big files open. Let's make this a tiny bit darker. Take the size up and just give where the flagstones would have had a bit more wear and tear. I'm going to give them a bit more wear and tear. on which we are slowing down a bit now. While doing a second is I'll close off one of the other documents we've got open. Yeah, so this one, um, which is the one that's available on um, Drive for at the moment, um, that's using up, um, yeah, best part of seven gig there. So let's... Uh, Close that off. And my um, holding screen isn't needed anymore, so we'll close that as well. And hopefully that'll make things a little bit smoother. So I'm just going to add this crack texture a couple of places here and there just to break up um, nice clean tiles. You, you want them to look a little bit broken. So anywhere where I've drawn a crack between tiles, I'll tend to then 
add this more cracked texture to that as well. And I'm just going to run through and do this uh, quickly. Normally, I'd go through and make sure it's sort of how I wanted it to look in each of the areas. But as we're on a bit of a timer here, let's uh, just get it generally along there just to show what it's doing. Let's make some big areas. Yeah, so we've varied the uh, textures and things up there a bit. So the next things I tend to do is some light sources. I think this big room might benefit from um, a couple of pillars or something similar just to um, break that line of sight off a bit. So let's maybe take a couple of these um, blocks out add some walls in and just make some obstacles inside this larger room. So I'm going to get the uh, guide layout back for that. Yeah, at the moment I think this room looks a little bit too open so if you've got an encounter going on in it it's just going to be a bit of a slugfest. So a couple of pillars should block that out nicely, give characters things to move around. Uh, if we get time later, we'll add some uh, rubble piles and things like that to uh, give some more tactical options. Uh, it might be a good place to put some elevation in, maybe some stairs, that sort of thing. Um, which if we're going to be doing stairs, I do need to chop the flagstones for that. So Let's leave stairs off of this one, just looking at the time, and let's go over a couple of pillars to break up the, uh, the layout of this room. So it looks like we've got 10 uh, squares across. I think. Yeah, so let's leave two open at the end. And let's look to do this sort of thing. In fact, I'm just going to um, remove those tiles. And try and give it a bit of symmetry. So that was uh, five from the top. So let's do five from the bottom. Looks like we've got nine there, so four between each should be about right. So we're going to go back to our wall layer, just wall those off. I'm just going to make sure I get the same shade. So I'm just going to take the layer effect off and sample out the colour. Let's make these blocks. <laughs> Letting go shift between the uh, the different pillars so it doesn't uh, go chasing across the room. These pillars will be handy for giving us something to um, put some shadows off of as well. Because one thing every adventuring party needs is somewhere for their rogue to hide. Or every dungeon needs somewhere for those uh, sneaky monsters to hide. Do it again. So the last thing I need to do is just make sure each of those um, gets the same um, void fill as the rest. Yeah, that's the wrong 
there, so void field layer. So they're filled like the rest of it now. So let's get rid of the uh, grids again, then we'll move on to the, uh, the lighting. So for the lighting, I have a divide layer here. And what we'll do is use some gradient overlays. And it, uh, easy to show, I think. So that's definitely going to be a point of light uh, coming from the outside gap here. So let's take a gradient with, let's go over blue. And we've got it on spherical. Let's change that to linear. And just flood that area through with light. Um, I want to change the, uh, the hue of that slightly. Take it down a notch or two. So we'll, we'll work with that as our base lighting layer. So that's a divide layer with a gradient overlay. Um, we'll tidy it where it's um, spilled into areas where we don't want it in a moment. Uh, one thing I have noticed is that a section of wall down there that I wanted to be broken and exposed is whole. So let's just take that section of wall off. And what we'll do to keep exactly the same bit of light source for light coming from the exterior is take the clone tool, uh, make it a little bit smaller maybe, and just source that from the same point of light. Even on the right layer, that'll help. So source that there and then paint that into that room. I might do the same with some of this light here just to uh, make it go uh, beyond a bit. Right, so what we'll do now is we only want the light to uh, appear on top of our flagstones. So I select the area around the flagstones, go back to the light layer and take that off of those. I'm just going to take a standard eraser on brush mode and tidy off some of the chunks of light that are where I don't want it. So that gives us our glow coming in from outside and we're going to break some of these super bright stones up in a moment and give them some more texture underneath so they're not quite so glaring. So one of the bits that can take that off is this crack layer on the flagstones. So first off, I want to make sure I'm only drawing on flagstones again. And then a darkish gray. Just brushed over there. We'll put some texture on and make them not just blocks of um, light color. I'll do the same on those there. And on this light layer, I'm just going to make sure that where that light's probably going to be blocked, it's not glowing forward, and to ease it off a little bit once it gets into the room. So in theory, that should look a bit more like daylight coming in through the, uh, the daylight exposed parts of this dungeon. So what I'm going to do before we do shadows, I'm just going to go in and... Um, fully break up the edges of these flagstones um, and then take off uh, layers and things above them. So we're going to go a bit closer into those. And uh, let's take off the first chunk just with the selection tool. And because there's so many more layers doing things to those stones higher up, you'll, you'll get the ghosts of those layers all showing. But we'll, we'll take the pattern down to where we want it to and then take those layers off. And 
to do the sort of fine tuning, we're going to use a pencil mode eraser. And take that down so it's nice and small. And then just cut some of these blocks into smaller chunks. Trying to avoid sharp edges and the like, make it look a bit more um, organic and natural. So this should, in theory, at the end, look a bit more like um, the broken rubble remains of some of the steps and uh, flagstones, where it's a uh, collapsed into the river at some point in the past, exposing whatever this is inside this uh, mountain or cliff or hill. So again, I'm going to go quite quick on these and uh, not necessarily go um, into as much detail as I might normally. Let's break this one up a little bit as well. Just don't want to spend too long on any one thing, so let's keep going quick across these. Okay, almost there. Yeah, so just a quick recap here is the flagstones that are kind of at the very edge of the map were a bit too uniform for my liking. I kind of wanted to um, break them down into some smaller chunks to make it look a bit more like um, the ruined edge. So what we've gone back to is the uh, the base sort of dungeon floor layer and taken some chunks out of it. Uh, what I'm now going to do is tidy up all the layers above it by selecting the empty space on the dungeon floor layer and then just going back through the various layers that make up the dungeon floor and taking away from those layers. Uh, I've got a little bit of uh, that shown, which I think is just where I need to put more embankment in. So let's just go back down to there. And just fill that in. So now we've got our broken edges. Um, with the flagstones lit up uh, more for daylight on the side of those. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to do some lighting effects, but more subtle lighting effects in some of the interior rooms. Um, oops, that's the wrong layer to be deleting on. Let's make sure I got rid of all of those. Yeah, ah, okay, yeah, that's why it's a brush layer. That's meant to be this tall. Right, so a razor selected. I'm going to switch back to brush, medium-ish opacity, uh, just because I can still see bits of my light layer where I don't want them at the minute. So I'm just going to take those off of there. Uh, let's give this room a light source of its own. So let's pick an area. And we're going to do the same trick. We're going to take a gradient fill. Uh, this time I'm going to do a spherical. And uh, let's go from about the center of the room and fill it in with a chunk of light. Now, I don't want it to be that bright, so we'll go in and adjust that. Uh, I'm going to change the color layer on that as well. So, maybe a bluish glow is what we're after. And because it's divide layer, the lighter I make it, the less it'll show up. So that's going to be relatively subtle. Uh, but if I take the bits off from the dungeon floor, so again, select all the space that isn't dungeon floor, go back to the light layer, and that'll take it out of all the, um, the cracks and grooves. But leave us with you know, a slightly lit up area in the middle of there. And... 
it would probably be good if that was also at the top and bottom. So what I might do is just undo that deletion. And I'm just going to use um, clone stamp to recreate that same effect at the other two ends of the room. Try and make sure it goes to the fade out. And do the same down here. Oh, when my cursor catches up. Second, that's taking some time. Let's try that again. Okay. All right, so now there's a couple of those different clothes in different parts of the biggest room. So now we're going to take out the, uh, the grouting lines and things from them. So that should give us a bit of variation across all the sort of colours of stones and things. And let's do something similar to this other one room here. Uh, so what we'll probably do in another step is go and change some of the, um, the colours of the flagstones at the base so that you end up with um, checker stone examples and things. Let's uh, take that there off. So like um, this room here, they've that's just changing the base stone color so that there's uh, patterns on the floor. All right, so we've got a bounding box around this, so let's give that a glow. And again, let's adjust it. Let's go for a slightly weirder sort of a violet colour for this room. And again, fade it down. I'm going to take the saturation down a little bit on that as well. And then just take it out of all the, um, the spaces between the actual uh, flagstones. And that one looks a tiny bit too bright, so I'm just going to do a low opacity eraser and just uh, take that down a little bit more. Right, so the next thing we want to do then is shadows. So shadows we're going to do freehand. So just for a brush and black. Uh, make sure the opacity is relatively low on that and the opacity on the shadows layer I've got at 80% at the minute. So if the light source, the main daylight, is going to be our key light source, um, we can imagine that maybe the uh, back of this room is a bit darker. And the corner maybe. And for these I'll block them in and then I'll probably come back over and reduce them down a little bit with the eraser again. So again, so we've got some pillars in here. If the light's coming in from the door there, let's uh, have some shadows fade off that way. Same over here. And to the back of the room. I mean, all likely the dungeon's probably pitch black, but you do kind of need to be able to see what you're doing. <laughs> it's nice to have a map filled in, so... There tends to be some indeterminate light sources just to, you know, make it a navigable dungeon. And if you're using um, one of the online um, tools, so Roll20 or similar, you can, of course, dynamic lighting all this sort of stuff up um, to hide the bits that aren't in use. And it's probably going to be a bit dark around the back of this one. But we don't want it too dark to be not visible. Give the room a bit of depth just by doing some uh, dark patches towards the corners. And same in here. Right, now some of those patches are a bit darker than I would have liked, but that's usually the way it happens. So there's always a bit where you come back in and just 
trim them back until they look about right. Trying to avoid sort of like blots where the uh, the brush has just left a splat. So what we mainly aim for here is just a bit of variation, tidying up a little bit of atmosphere. I've got some of the light line there I'd like to reduce as well. I need to take that up to get rid of that. <laughs> Another bit of shadow behind this wall as it's uh, directly behind our big chunk of daylight. Cool, so let's um, pop a pattern down um, in some colour on the floor in this room here just to show how that works. Give it that sort of, you know, classic hero questy style uh, multicoloured floor. Uh, let's try a green. And see how pattern might work. So I might lighten that down a bit so take the saturation off of it. Yeah, there we go. And let's fill in a bit of a checkerboard there. I think I'm just going to fill in between the pillars. I'm trying to make sure I get my pattern right. And this is just really to break it up so it's not just the same type and colour of floor all over the place. So it gives us a bit of interest for uh, what is probably the main room. Right, and that's flagstone's pretty much done there. So what I've got here is a extra sort of rubbling layer. This is just another um, texture, uh, which will help on these sort of broken up areas. So let's go in. I'll put some of this on and then we'll have a quick look at the uh, settings for it. So this one is purely a pattern overlay with a rubble pattern. And it's hard light so you'll be able to see uh, what's below it for the most part, depending on what that is. So this will give me some nice Bits of broken stonework effectively coming off from uh, where we would assume it'd be on these uh, edge tiles. And we'll just scatter that slightly down the uh, side of that embankment. And then help break up some of these shapes behind by putting some more of it across those. Also knowing that some of our cliff is underneath where our floor texture might be, so I'm just going to take that off. So we're back onto the eraser here, and that's just to take that off and put the sort of grout line type colour back in underneath it, which might need a little bit of filling in because it's uh, got some river there. So let's just take a sample of that and stick it over there. So back to the uh, the rubble. And I mainly want to be doing this around the uh, the bits of um, broken terrain, which in this particular map is just these um, edges that come out onto the riverside. It should help gel in where the uh, flagstones uh, finish and where it goes onto the embankment.
And something else I want to think I'm going to do now is just break up some of these uh, nice clean uh, wall sections. I'm uh, going to do that with an eraser set into pencil mode again at full opacity. Set nice and small. Uh, obviously, there's no uh, adventure or uh, anything written for this particular dungeon yet because it's kind of been done on the fly. Uh, it'd be interesting to see what people's thoughts are on what you could possibly have here. Let's just make this a bit more broken up and try and make sure there's no uh, particularly spiky angles. And what we might do there is just take some of those and just move them uh, so they're not quite so uh, uniform. So instead of using the eraser now, I'll switch to uh, selecting and just uh, moving some of those bits out of it so we get broken wall edge. I'll do the same over here. So I'll take that sharp spike off and then grab little chunks of it at a time and just move them around a bit. Let's just finish by uh, taking another couple of chunks. So that should give us a nicer broken edge to those walls there. I'll just do the same with these ones up here. Let's just uh, get rid of the, uh, the round pencil edge. Do the same trick of uh, selecting some bits and just moving them around. That looks a bit too neat edgewise. I'm just going to take that bit off. So yeah, it just looks a little bit nicer and neater as a broken wall edge as opposed to just coming to a, a flat stop there. Right, so almost done on those. Right. Have a quick look at the whole thing. Another trick you can do is with the uh, the navigator, um, have that open while you're working close in, just to sort of like you know see what the uh, overall map's looking like as you're working away. And one of the things tends to happen, I think, when drawing any sort of like dungeon map, is you start to think about what you you might place there, how it might be approached by your um, adventuring party, um, how your players are going to interact, and you know deal with what you've put there. So for this one here, looking at it, what have we got? We've got two routes in. Um, I think I'll probably yeah, like go with the um, separate type of challenge approach. So one of them could be slightly easier to get to, but more likely to be guarded by whatever is in here. Uh, the other one, maybe that's more difficult to get to. Maybe the cliff face is um, far more slimy or slippery or wet or the like or maybe there's a trap or something else that takes a bit more um, of a skill challenge to negotiate and to get in, but around the back of um, whatever would be guarding the main way in. And obviously dungeons don't necessarily need to uh, <laughs> have appropriate content and form for a real building, because I'm not entirely sure what that back corridor there would be used for. I mean, maybe it would have um, had a doorway at some point that goes further off and that's just two ways of accessing the inner chamber here, 
As far as we're concerned, that's a nice way of scooting around the back and getting different angles into the combat and what will be the main combat encounter, boss encounter type thing for this little dungeon area. Right, so we've come back up to have a look to see how those work. I'm going to put some more um, rubble um, splats and things underneath those with that texture. Just to help show where those walls are um, broken up. At the moment, I think I might take um, some of the light down here a little bit. I think it's still a, a bit too bright on the daylight edges. So the easiest way of doing that is a nice big eraser brush with a low opacity. Because the last time I used it, it was tiny, it's going to take a few clicks to get that to a nice big brush. OK, so that's taken that down a little bit so it's not quite as um, bright and uh, yellowish on the edges. So we're definitely getting there within the, um, the dungeon areas itself. So I'm going to um, go back and do some more work on this exterior and the cliff face and the, uh, the riverbank. So here I've got some um, cliff texture um, hiding under the back of there. Let's take that over there out of the way a bit. So these are just going to give us a bit more of an outdoor um, appearance to the uh, the embankmenty sort of cliff edges on this side here. So these are a bit of texture I've uh, previously prepared. Um, so basically faded off towards the edges and the like and got nice bits of shape and put them so they're shaded towards the bottom with some highlights along the ridge to try and give a bit of a sense of depth. I'll just put some of these in place and then tidy them up from there. Need to find out where those others are. They're hiding behind here somewhere. Let's just grab them out. I'll go for and tidy these once I've got the main sort of building blocks in place. rotate again. Okay, that's about enough to cover the run we're after. So I'm just going to use the uh, clone stamp to steal a couple of bits of texture from some areas and put it in others. Just so we've got everything covered and then we can go for and tidy. So this bit here needs some It's not picked it up. Come on. So as the file size gets um, bigger, Photoshop can slow down a little bit. There we go. Right, so let's fill that texture in there. And a bit just at the end there. Uh, 
I think I want a little bit here just to make this go a bit further around. So I'm going to use the um, healing one here just to uh, fix up some of these gaps here. So that will just find like pixels nearby and just repeat them across and try and uh, seamlessly repair the pattern. So anywhere there's um, big angular pieces that I don't really want, I'm just going to use that tool to tidy those out. Uh, the ones on the waterline, we're going to just um, scrub those off with the eraser. So let's take those off on the river edge. I'm just going to bring my uh, grid line back again just to make sure we've got um, some fairly obvious blocks about what's um, cliff, what's um, river, etc. One of the things um, for any map that's working with a grid, make sure <laughs> you're drawing and thinking of that grid. Uh, nothing worse than having like a door and you're not sure whether it's in you know, one space or another space. Uh, same here, yeah, like um, with the GM sort of saying, you know, like uh, if you're in the river, you're being swept away that way, but you're like, okay, but you know, half of that looks like it's a cliff edge. So is that cliff or river? So you can make that a little bit easier for them just by making sure it's relatively obvious which is which. Obviously, you need to be careful not to just have big square angular blocks everywhere. Right, now some of these is the texture underneath, so I'm just going to uh, trim that down a bit. And I'm going to take the uh, burn tool now and just darken some of the edges of the bottom of that cliff face, just so it looks like it's lower down. And I need to be on the right layer for that. I think generally speaking, if you're ever working on um, a layer and it's not working, you're on the wrong layer. <laughs> it happens so often. So that's darkening the edge of those up. I'm going to cut off a couple of spot highlights using the dodge tool. Uh, so this is just to sort of make some of the tops of these rocks have bright spots on. Again, just to try and help with um, perspective a little bit on a flat map. <laughs> this is our first live Twitch. <laughs> So, yeah, forgive any uh, little mistakes and things, but yeah, not our first time drawing maps, but our first time doing it live on a stream. I just noticed that texture hasn't quite filled in there, so I'm just going to uh, re grab the clone stamp and put the texture back there, and then quickly do those other two steps. So, uh, burn in the base. And then go back to highlights. So yeah, people will have to let us know if this is useful, if we should do more of this sort of thing. Uh, I believe we've got another definite event planned for the UK Games Expo um, virtual expo uh, near the end of August. Right now they're done. I'm going to just uh, tidy off some of these uh, shapes here so it merges into the... Uh, a void fill sort of cave interior rock sort of texture kind of show that these bits are outside you know exposed to the elements and where it goes into the sort of the blacker color that's inside the rock you know the uh, voids between the dungeon walls type thing So who knows, at some point, you know, there might have been a balcony or a window here, but for whatever reason, this bit was out and exposed, and the same with this chunk here. Maybe a bit of cliff fell off at some point to expose bits of dungeon. It could be anything. Okay, 
and let's uh, put some attention onto this other side of the river now. So we've got a crack texture here, so like cracked earth style texture. So I'm just going to get a complementary sort of brown colour. And then check if this is the one I think it is. Yeah, so it's, uh, let's zoom in, it's quite subtle. So this is adding these little cracks and more sort of, I don't know, um, small scale details to help blend in sort of the, uh, the big rocky edge and the water. Try and make it a little less uh, angular. Uh, we're going to do um, something else later on with uh, what I call uh, a moss layer, so like um, plant edges and things, which will also tidy uh, chunks of these bits up. I'm just waiting for all this to catch up. Photoshop's uh, definitely filling a cache at the minute. <laughs> So sometimes if I've made this many layers in what's not normally this short an amount of time, uh, I might save off, um, clear some caches and things, and then reopen. But obviously for the stream, I'm going to keep it going. We might just have to wait a second while it um, puts these texture layers in. As soon as it gives me my cursor back, I'll know it's finished doing it. I'll just try not to get carried away by doing too many things at once because then we just got to wait for it to catch up. That does give me time to have a drink. So a lot of these um, types of layers and effects and things like that are of what we developed for the dungeon book. So you will see a very similar sort of styling in the floors and things. Still going. Uh, similar type of um, wall layout, uh, although most of these outdoor spaces and things didn't really feature in the dungeon because of yeah, it was a dungeon. All right, there we go. It's finally finished. So let's put that crack uh, layer on there. I'll do a few more, but let's just do it in small increments so it doesn't uh, backlog like that. I think that's also a subtle enough effect. We're going to leave that for a minute if it's going to take uh, that long to uh, process it through. And let's get on to, I'll just demonstrate what um, I tend to do with the walls to finish the walls off. Uh, I might not have a chance to do all of them in this session, although we're still 40 minutes, so maybe. Uh, so let's just do a room and go from there. So I tend to take just a little slice and start making um, brick chunks. In fact, that one's probably a bit too narrow, so I'm just going to get a slightly wider slice. And also, it'll take a little while to do this for all the walls all the way around. Uh, I do keep meaning to make a, um, a custom brush for this, but I've not got around to it in time for this demo, so I'll just show uh, a more manual way of doing it for the minute. So I tend to go around and do all the um, vertical, then all the horizontal, just so that I don't have to keep changing the tool. And doing it by hand, you end up with relatively uneven bricks, which is kind of what I'm after. So I'm just going to do this one room. And then if we get a chance, I'll uh, do some more of the rest uh, before the end. So I'll swap to this way around. That's quite a 
on bricks. Let's divide that up a little bit again. Not the most interesting bit this, but it does leave um, a nice effect at the end. Uh, what we'll do in a minute as well is we'll go and just uh, move some of these around a little bit so they're not all quite so uniform. Just a couple more, and then we get this room finished. Okay, that's the majority of those slabs there. So just do a selection wand and just control cursor to move selected pixels and just shuffle some of them around so you end up with slightly less even regular nicely made walls it just seems a bit more in fitting with a uh, old dungeon type building normally i'd leave this sort of step till um, i'd already cut all the sort of brick shapes out select a lot of the same either horizontal or vertical and then shift them all at once so you know like you'd pick so you know that one that one that one that one sort of thing and then just make all of them shuffle a little bit just to um, do them on bulk sort of thing So yeah, eventually you'd want to do the entire dungeon like that, so that you've got the um, the walls and the bricks all nicely defined. And you might decide that, you know, because you've gone round quickly at the start using the pencil tool, that you want to even some of these up. So you might just select the top of that one, do a transform on it, and just bring it down when it eventually moves. to make a bigger, straighter brick. So I could do the same here to uh, square off the end of this one. I accidentally moved it instead. Let's shift it back. And this is a shift transform, so it moves only on the, uh, the one axis for scale instead of scaling the whole thing. Avoid it with quite a wide wall as well. Okay, so we're looking quite good there. Um, I still want to do a little bit of work on the sort of grass outer here and this embankment and maybe put some more um, lumps of ruins and things across here. So you know, make it look more like this has fallen out. Uh, for the minute, let's go on to the moss layer. So this is just a color and pattern overlay and it tends to um, Let's find on this one. It's all of these um, green, mossy, you know, like um, plant ingrowth sort of bits that kind of help sort of tie the map together and make it look nice and old. And they're good for uh, just joining some disparate bits and making everything look a bit nicer, I think. So I just need a green. There's a color overlay on there as well, but it just seems to make sense doing green. And this is with the brush on a medium-ish opacity. I need to shrink that down. And we'll need to zoom in to get this working. So I'm going to use this to tidy up where I've got the um, the cliff underlay there. If actually, let's take a bit of that off because it is a bit strong. Let's 
should do. Let's go back to the Moss layer when it catches up. Right, so maybe even smaller than that. So what this one will give us is um, some green plant life. So we can show that this dungeon's been exposed to the elements for a while and has started to uh, grow mossy and mouldy. It just gives it a nice sort of aged look. As well as, importantly, introducing a nice other colour you tend not to get too often. And I can use it on some of these ruined patches to find something in the pattern. And if I circle it around with moss, I can highlight that particular lump of, you know, ruined stone. That one's gone slightly over. So I'd want a bit of that shape to show that it's, you know, just there nestled in amongst all the moss. And we use this to help join the inside and the exterior space. So I've seen a nice um, join line that we missed earlier and when we were um, speedily putting the, uh, the cliffs in. So let's do a different way as opposed to blending it with the, um, the healing wand. Let's just uh, make that plant life grow out and down and cover that line. I'm afraid Photoshop is crawling a bit at the moment. We're up to about a four gig file size on this working file. I think I'll just close off the uh, in example uh, document as well. So part of this will help, I think, with what we were talking about earlier, about how um, you might make one uh, entrance a bit easier than the other to get into. So when I go over to this side here, let's uh, make sure there's plenty of uh, the green there to make it look like it's uh, been wetter and grown a bit more life. Because if nothing else, what you might want to do is uh, encourage your party to, uh, you know, split up a little, which can be a bit easier if you're doing on a battle map. So you can see exactly where they are on that map. And, you know, get one side of part of the party in trouble while the other side can't quite get to them as easily. That's one advantage of having more than one uh, entrance into the dungeon you've made. So this one, I'm just going to uh, put quite a bit of greenery around. So I'm now waiting a little bit for Photoshop to catch up. Now, I normally keep my layers separate, but I'm tempted for this demo to um, collapse some of those down so that we can um, speed Photoshop up without me having to restart it, because at the moment that's what's being streamed. Uh, so let's collapse some of these layers. As that will free up. Some of the system here, uh, we didn't use that layer, so that one can stay out. Background layer isn't needed. And if I put all these ones uh, with all the transformation and patterns in, that should helpfully 
save it as well so let's just merge selected I'm just watching this in full screen just to make sure that merging it doesn't uh, change any of the layer effects final details, which it hasn't, so we'll leave that there. And hopefully that will have uh, taken the file size down a bit and give us a bit more responsiveness for filling in these uh, green lines. Yeah, that's better. So for the most part, I'm going to mirror where the um, the grout lines and things are. Uh, every so often, I just take a, a line of the moss layer and just sort of cut a new bit of pattern from it where I feel it might be better to be patterned up a little bit more and a little bit more broken. And sometimes you just want a light green light just to sort of like give a little hint. And then other places you might want to uh, go a bit heavier, like here. I think I'm going to tidy up the edge of that bit of rubble and just highlight it around with some of the green. And just make sure I tighten in by putting similar patches onto the cliff side as well. So it'll look like the same bit of plant life grown down there. Through time, let's put some into some of these other areas. I'll just help tie it all in to the same patterns and things. Obviously, you may want to take your party. Um, builds into consideration when designing things. If you're a uh, wizard heavy, for example, you might not want so many uh, fireball handy spaces, or, or maybe you do. <laughs> maybe you want to make sure everyone's in um, that particular uh, radius. But yeah, definitely tailoring for a party is good. And you want to be thinking about different sort of challenges, difficult terrain, other sort of elements you might want to put into a map. Uh, just checking the time. We've got about 20 minutes. So I'm going to do some more of these green patches, but I might leave um, doing as much as I normally do across the map until uh, finishing this up after. Uh, yeah, so normally the sort of areas that will be exposed to the exterior, I normally go quite heavy on the um, the green lines. And on the interiors, you know, you want them scattered around for bits of interest just to break up the same patterns of grey, put a splat of colour in and you know make it look a bit more old and overgrown. So yeah just some examples there for now and Yeah, this particular sort of um, stage can take ages, depending on just how detailed you want to get putting it across. So let's do a little bit just on the other riverbank. There's also a splat there I need to get rid of where there's a nice round circle. Just check which layer it's on. It's the cliff texture. So let's just uh, make that a little bit less brush strokey. Oh, and just so people know, we've got um, another Twitch um, event tomorrow, uh, same sort of time. Uh, this is going to be a look through uh, essentially our existing products and our new and upcoming products. And we'll also take a look at some of the stuff that's still very much at drawing board stage. If that's of interest, and that's a Gen Con event, it's also just on this Twitch channel. So I'm going to go back to the moss layer and I'm just going to do a couple of the same bits of pattern on this side uh, just to ease the edge of this embankment in a bit. 
and try and gel the uh, the green grass texture into it a bit as well. So I've gone slightly bigger on the brush here because obviously there's a, a lot more greenery to uh, integrate. Uh, I'm not going to put any trees and things on this side. This is uh, mainly there as a bit of a marshalling area for the uh, the players to set themselves up. And you know maybe you've got snipers somewhere in the uh, the broken tunnel sort of area here. Maybe there's something in the water that's going to um, be problematic for them trying to get across. I mean, quite so much fun as tentacles in water. Just going to take the edge off of that one a bit, so it fades a bit with the water. This is again to get rid of some of the um, the lines from earlier. There's just where we've quickly gone and put in some of those textures. There's still some uh, definite brush strokes there, but I can hide them off. Um, by adding these bits of texture in here. And this helps tie in this greenery with this greenery. So it looks like it's part of the same you know, environment. All right, I've got a bit of a straight line there. Let me just find out which layer that's hiding on. That looks through the water layer. So I'm just going to take a healing brush. And see if I can make that less straight. Yeah, so one of the things to always watch out for when using blocks of text like this is if you do end up with um, harsh lines between them like that. Um, what you can quite often do is miss that they're there if you've got um, a grid up because they can be hidden by the grid. So always good to go and check those things through with grid lines off and any grids you might put on the map itself. So for example, I think here I've got a uh, an actual drawn grid that can go onto the map. So for uh, one of the versions, we tend to do a gridded version and a non-gridded version. And the main bit there for that um, is so that we can set how those grid lines work so you don't necessarily have to use the uh, overlays that you get with whatever program you're using. Oh, I'm on the wrong layer here, which is why that's not working. So that grid, I'm going to hide it again in a minute, but I'm just going to set it to a soft light first so that it's um, a bit more subtle. And take the opacity down on that a little bit. All right, we'll get back to that grid in a second. So first I'm just going to check that we're about where we want to be with that map. So I think we're looking about there. Um, so something that we might do here is go and get some uh, assets. So, you know, pre-drawn things like um, statues, doors, um, you know, fallen piles of rocks, things like that, and add those in. Um, obviously, you can draw them fresh, um, but just for an example, let me get an asset that we've already got and put a, I'll just go over a pile of rubble for this one, uh, just to show putting that in and merging it in a bit. So I'm just in Bridge, one of the other Adobe pieces at the minute, finding the file I want. It'll just take me a second. Yeah, so I'm going to take a piece from uh, one of our uh, War and Siege sticker sheets. So this is one of the Photoshop masters for um, a decal sheet, uh, which are static cling, um, you know, reusable stickers effectively. Uh, but what I'm going to do, I'm just going to grab one of these uh, rubble piles from here. Copy that. And pop that in. Let's put it just above the light layer. So I've got a pile of broken rocks. Uh, let's say they're going to be 
somewhere here. I'll try and make them um, fit neatly across a couple of blocks. So this will be just something to block line of sight a little bit so you don't see straight down there if there isn't a door or anything. And let's just uh, work on merging that asset in. So this, this could have been any asset. So you're like a statues, magic circles, furniture, uh, anything you might look at. So let's uh, take the moss from it just because that's now doesn't need to be going across the uh, the grout line of the rocks. We can put some of the, uh, the moss on it. But we want to go a bit neater and a bit closer in. So, you know, you could show that growing over the top of some of the bricks in between and sort of highlight across there. Let's wait for that to catch up. So there's definitely a couple of things I'm not going to get finished uh, during this stream, which is essentially finishing off the walls, finishing off uh, adding all sort of the green moss lines and things. Uh, I'd imagine if that's not done today, then that'll be tomorrow. And then we can post this up on drive through. Uh, we'll do the same as the um, the other sample map. So we'll just put it up as a uh, a free or pay what you want map, so that you can grab that as well. Uh, I imagine we'll uh, tweet out about that. So if you're not following us on Twitter, we're Battle Maps UK. Uh, it should be across any other social media we've got going as well, or just look for us on drive through. So I'm just going to make sure I name that layer. Uh, maybe not with caps on. Um, I'm not always as good as it as I should be, but naming all the layers really pays dividends if you come back to work on a map. So <laughs> definitely the advice label your layers, group them wherever possible as well, just to keep track of what's what. Uh, so I'm just going to um, use the eraser to take off these um, hard edges from this uh, asset that I put in. Check the time. So we've just got over 10 minutes left. What I'll do is about another five minutes on this, and then I might quickly show one of the um, wilderness maps that we're working on for the next modular book set. Uh, so the first two sets are the dungeon, which is very much in the style like I'm doing here. And the next one was towns and taverns, which was more sort of fantasy streets, urban environments, uh, you know, building interiors particularly the uh, all-important tavern. And the next set we're doing, which will probably be a Kickstarter early next year, I guess, will be for wilderness-based um, environments. I've just got to wait for my tool to catch up now. I think while we're running into the last uh, 10 minutes as well, if anyone's got any questions, uh, please fire them into the chat. I'll try and read them. Tam's also on the chat, so uh, we'll hopefully catch them and see if we can get you an answer. And yeah, please do feedback if this has been a useful stream to do as well. As I think we mentioned earlier, it's the first time we've done anything like this, so it'll be great to know how it's gone. I think in theory it's the most I've um, spoken at a computer screen at any single one time that I can remember as well. Well, apart from DM online, which seems to be um, happening a lot now as well. Oh, good to hear. It. Thank you.
I think we'll try and um, put this together as a bit of a blog post as well with all those step-by-step um, -step pictures for uh, the other map that we showed near the start. Um, at the moment, I, I merged those layers together, I'm afraid, to, uh, to get Photoshop to be a bit more responsive on the stream. Um, in, uh, let's see if I've got a chance. Yeah, uh, what I'll do is I'll quickly just finish off this bit of asset here and then show um, a different file just to show those back again. But essentially, the base layer I did with um, a pattern. Uh, so I'd pre-drawn a lot of the flagstones up. Then the first sort of bottom layer of those was essentially just bevels and embossers and a drop shadow. Yep. Um, then there was another further pattern on top, which kind of did all these, um, it's a divide layer. So it's uh, a bunch of pebbles, but it inverts. So it just gives you little white sort of like streaks and cracks and things. And uh, then I tend to have two uh, marble textures, one light, one dark, um, both to give different sort of patterns to different areas of the rocks. Uh, that, that's essentially it for the flagstones. Uh, I think essentially you've just got to toy around with different patterns and textures to get something you like. Uh, make sure you either keep a note of it or keep a document with that um, available. Uh, I'm just going to give these a quick shadow to show that they're raised up. And then we'll probably save this map off and I'll show one of those um, wilderness ones we're working on just because they're a, a different sort of thing. So here this shadow layer is actually above the layer with this rubble on it. So I just need to be careful um, where I place it so it doesn't uh, block in the wrong areas. It's going on quite heavy so I'm just going to go over it again and erase some of that off in a second as well. So it's slightly higher. There we go. Right, so we're going to save that map as is for the moment. I'll uh, finish off the extra couple of bits and pieces that are needed for that and post it up to drive through, I'd imagine, tomorrow. Um, obviously, this one's been a bit of a speed go, so. <laughs> Some bits may have been done a bit quicker and are a bit more rough and ready than maybe we would have liked at times. Uh, what would also be interesting is any suggestions for names for this dungeon, because we'd have to give it a name. Uh, we normally relatively um, say what you see on those, but, you know, open to suggestions. Right, so I'm going to save this map off and close it now. So I think we're about there. I mean, I'll probably add a couple more features maybe in these rooms. Or, you know, if you're using the VTT or printed out, you can always put your own 3D scenery on or your own tokens and things on. All right, so that's saved. So let's close that one up. And let's close that. And let's I'll show one that's uh, finished and one that's uh, in progress. So this is uh, one from the um, the wilderness set. Oh yeah, just another little Photoshop bit of trivia there. Uh, PSB tend to always have to start things in the large um, format size because they always, always go over two gig when you're working on them. Um, just the size of mats and the level of DPI and layers we tend to use. Uh, so this is a four page spread um, all the odd sort of like um, guidelines there, that's because this is for print. So we need to have uh, bleeds in place and know where the spine of the books are going to go and similar things. So this one here, this one, I think I've currently got it called um, Grass Canyons. So this is going to be two pages in one book at the top there, two pages in the other book at the bottom. And this one, in theory, you could lay out a bunch of different ways. Uh, have your characters moving through 
canyony type depressions with grass at the top so it'll merge well with like um, a pure grass page or sort of tie in neatly with more sort of scrubby desert style pages which we've got planned and are working on as well and let's open one that's currently halfway done so again with the um, the canyons one uh, we've got common entry exit the same we do with our um, modular dungeon books and the modular uh, fantasy city books so that when you mix and match different pages from different books together you exit one page and enter the other at the same sort of place uh, so this one is going to be four pages of forest at the moment i've got two pages mainly done uh, this is um, a good example of getting textures and things. So the tree there is a tree we photographed on a walk uh, to um, Nyman's, which is a, a National Trust site fairly near where we are in the south of England, and took a nice picture of a fallen tree that I could then clip out from where I'd take, you know, like exported it and put it onto here as a fallen tree in the map. Uh, got about four minutes left. So yeah, any more questions, keep them going. Um, this one we tend to do tree trunks um, as opposed to foliage because you can then work out tactics where you're going to be under and around those tree trunks uh, a bit easier than just sort of putting all your characters on top of the foliage so this one we've got this little area here which is you know a fallen tree and a bit of a gully in the forest then a forest clearing uh, this one's going to have a sketch layer on it as well so if I just enable that that's my uh, very informative sketch layer. Um, the grey blots are where tree trunks are planned. The long bit's a fallen tree, and that brown bit there is where I'm planning on putting a path through that piece of woods. So not the most detailed of um, sketches, but it's just there to uh, map out where things are. Uh, one thing that's probably worth uh, quickly showing is, I don't think I mentioned earlier. Um, let me just see if I've got it here. So if you're using Roll20 or similar, you might want to absolutely make sure you get your grid lines and things uh, matched up. And one thing you can do is either really early on when blocking out the um, the sketch, and definitely the end is put it into Roll20 or you know, whichever VTT you're using and make sure it lines up and works the grid. I did take a screenshot of doing that earlier. So let me just grab that and just show you what I mean. Because anyone who's using VTT at the minute will probably know that, you know, nothing's worse than putting your map in and having to spend half an hour getting it to a aligned grid properly. So if you are the map maker, doing that for anyone else is going to be great. So this is just, um, I, I tend to keep a reference game running in Roll20. And in that reference game, I'll put in maps that I'm um, using and I'll measure them up. Uh, we've also started, we've only got one pack up at the minute, but we've started um, as actual content creators on Roll20, so our assets are there now as well, where we've optimised them. On here, yeah, I've gone on and sized the map for the grid, so what you tend to do, let me just show you, so on this one, um, as we're drawing them, the image size will be a 300 dpi and we'll set the uh, sizing exactly for the amount of inches. This one's a bit weird because obviously it's got bleeds because it's a print file. Um, but what you'll do is you'll change the resolution down to 72. Um, or you could use 144 if your map's not that big and you want to keep some more detail in it. But the main thing for exporting for VTT is don't make the file size too big for the online ones. Uh, so for Roll20, I tend to go resolution 72 save a copy like that, import it in, make it the same grid size as the inch size, and it should match up perfectly to where your grid is. So this was me testing the one that's gone up onto drive through earlier today to make sure that everything is where we think it should be. And I think we are just about out of time. So thanks everyone. Um, we may see some of you tomorrow for the uh, Q&A session and the look at new products. And we'll be doing a similar stream to this again next month for um, Virtual Expo. So thank you all and enjoy the rest of Gen Con Online. Thank you.